Uh, so I'm going to try to zoom us forward a little bit more, um, all the way up to 21st century. Um, so my name is Jake Green. Um, I study uh, smartphones, mobile media, um, kind of thinking about, um, in a lot of my research, um, how these technologies are not just um, ways for us to do kind of the same things that we do on traditional computers, um, but they allow us to interact with one another and with the physical world in entirely uh, new ways. Um, so some of these ways are relatively mundane. If you've ever used Uber or Lyft, maybe to get to you know, a hotel when you get to a new town or something like that. Um, but there are a lot of other ways that these technologies can be used um, that I make an argument for as uh, technologies for writing, and specifically as technologies for uh, location-based writing. So that's the case that I try to make in a lot of my research and that I want to talk about um, today. Um, so for uh, one, of the, one of the biggest areas that's kind of emerging uh, with smartphones so around uh, you know, 2010 or so as smartphones start to grow and you know, take over, and I think it was just a few years ago, around 2014, 2015, um, the usage of smartphones and tablets and mobile computing began to overtake traditional desktop and laptop uh, computing. So smartphones are a lot more popular. And along with that came new types of experiences for how we can use computers in more specific contexts or situations. Um, and so one of the main um, technologies of this kind of emerging uh, computing paradigm um, is augmented reality. Um, so augmented reality applications overlay digital media uh, into registration with physical space in some way. So here's an example. Um, if you've ever been to Ikea, uh, they have a new smartphone app where you can view what furniture might look like uh, within the space of your own home. Um, there's a lot of applications in the medical industry, um, industrial design fields to help people maybe learn how to put together you know, a new piece of equipment or something like that. So there's a lot of different areas. Um, it's talked about in Silicon Valley in terms of being a disruptive technology. Um, a lot of companies are investing in kind of this type of experience as the future for what computing actually is. Not just something that we do on a computer when we're sitting down or even when we're walking around and just staring at our phones, but something that we do in the context of a particular location um, or you know, situation, you know, buying furniture uh, or something like that. But for many of you, augmented reality, probably most popular in the context of Pokemon Go. Um, does anybody play Pokemon Go? Or have played it before? Yeah, I know Bruce um, So I played this a little bit around, this came out around 2016 when I was writing a dissertation on augmented reality, so unfortunately I didn't have a lot of time to actually play it. Um, but it is a fascinating example. Um, I think it's probably one of the most popular augmented reality applications um, to emerge in the last few years. So if you're not familiar with the game, basically it allows you to uh, walk around you know, the physical world pretty much mostly anywhere, particularly prominent public spaces, and find and track down uh, digital monsters or Pokemon um, in different environments. And so usually these monsters, you can find them, um, they correspond to the areas where they naturally inhabit in the game space itself. So if you're looking for um, you know, I, I don't know, Bruce, what's it, a Spiro or something like that, you'd probably go to like a public park or somewhere with lots of trees. And if you're looking for a water-based Pokemon, you might go to like a public park um, that has a river or, you know, an oceanfront. So I don't know if in the desert it might be tough to find those kind of Pokemon. Uh, but essentially the game imagined the physical world as a digital and physical space. So we're beginning to see that, that barrier between the digital and the physical um, kind of beginning to converge a little bit within the context of this game. Wildly popular, people, a lot of people are still playing this game, um, hu hugely successful. Um, however, there was a lot of problems with this convergence. It wasn't just uh, an easy transition to this world of spatial computing. Um, so one of the first problems that began to arise with Pokemon Go uh, is people were just kind of following uh, where their phones told them to go to find Pokemon, sometimes onto even private property. Um, people were found you know, going into homes, people's backyards, um, areas that weren't supposed to go in, construction sites, you know, people were getting injured. Um, parks were getting overrun, you know, public parks in small towns were getting overrun with too many players. Um, and they just didn't have the resources to you know, resod or pick up litter or things like that. And so governments began suing the company who made uh, Pokemon Go to, to recoup costs for having to bring more employees out to these sites because the company that made Pokemon Go was basically using the physical world as a site of profit for their game. 
Um, today, there is a, if you go to Pokemon Go death there's actually a site that keeps track of the number of people who have either died or been injured while playing Pokemon Go. Now, not all of these deaths, I think, can be attributed actually to playing the game itself. Um, a lot of them, maybe it was just happening at the same time. Um, but in some cases, people maybe went into somebody's private property um, and they were injured um, or weren't paying attention while playing the game and fell um, or something like that. Um, but basically, this kind of illustrates there are, there are problems with um, this kind of emerging, this emerging computing paradigm. Um, it's not just, a, not just a way of over, you can't just unproblematically overlay all these things onto physical space. Um, another prominent concern that emerged with Pokemon Go is people were beginning to play in sensitive cultural spaces, um, U.S. Holocaust Museum, Auschwitz, um, the 9-11 uh, Memorial Center. Um, essentially, the game worked by having an algorithm that allowed digital monsters to spawn kind of all over the world. Um, and the company really wasn't thinking at first a lot about where uh, those digital monsters were spawning and what the consequences for that might be. And so people were talking a lot about these issues when the game came out. Um, eventually, I think the game designers took down a lot of those spawning locations in these sensitive cultural spaces. Um, another big concern um, was the areas in which people could actually play this game. So these are screenshots of the Pokemon Go map um, in poor minority neighborhoods in Oakland, I think, and Chicago. Um, normally, these are populated with you know little monsters or like. Uh, gyms, which are areas where you can engage other players um, in battles. Uh, but these were completely empty uh, in a lot of these neighborhoods. Um, and so part of what this demonstrated, and people were posting about this on Twitter with the hashtag MyPokeyHood, part of what this demonstrated is that spatial injustices can still emerge through these locative gameplays. That, you know, although Pokemon Go might imagine the physical world as a neutral space, politically neutral, um, that doesn't mean that these injustices will not still manifest during uh, when players are engaging with the game uh, itself. Um, so in her article, Afraid to Roam, the Unlevel Playing Field of Pokemon Go, uh, Katie Salen describes this as um, the way that location-based games force us to look beyond the rules governing the play inside the game to the social and cultural codes governing the context in which the game is embedded. So all of these examples demonstrate how uh, locative media, mobile media, forces us to kind of contend with spatial inequalities and the politics of different locations in certain ways. So a lot of the mobile apps that um, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, things like Uber, Lyft, Google Maps, um, they kind of imagine a physical space kind of as this mostly just kind of politically neutral site, you know, for things like, you know, travel, uh, entertainment, reviewing restaurants, things like that. This kind of, you know, space is kind of this consumer space. Um, that doesn't really speak back or have anything to say back to the person using uh, the application. However, there are some people who are beginning to think of these technologies, how they can transform this kind of politically neutral idea of space as just a site for, you know, augmenting with whatever things that we might want to do with our phones, and more about thinking of how they can become places. So uh, I draw on some of my research on uh, the philosopher Ifu Tuan, who writes about the difference between this kind of undifferentiated space that mobile apps um, think of space as versus place. And he says that place is pause. Each pause in movement makes it possible for location to be transformed into place. So in my research, um, I look at the way uh, different artists and activists are using emerging mobile technologies. I mean, I actually create some of these experiences myself to create more placeful interactions with different locations. So ways that we can kind of dig into uh, the layers of cultural or historical meaning uh, within different areas. So these are a few, um, just a few minor uh, simple examples. Um, some of the earliest ones, uh, museums began using uh, the popularity of smartphones to allow people to access historical footage or arch archival media uh, within places where um, historic images have been taken in London. So the Street Museum app um, allows people to tour London and access different, um, different images or historical events in those different areas. And if you've ever done something like uh, a GPS-guided audio tour or something like that, you may have done something similar. Um, and before it's too late, the Miami Mural Project was created by Linda Chung in Miami. Um, it allows citizens of Miami to access information about the effects of climate change uh, in their local spaces. So in general and in my research, I think about as computers become more, um, uh, more mobile, become more uh, placeful, allow us to interact with locations in this way, 
how could we think of these as writing technologies? So not just as ways to you know get from A to B or you know review restaurants, or, you know catch monsters, you know all those things are fascinating. Uh, but how could we use these to kind of dig into those cultural, social, political layers of a location, allow you know, those moments of pause in spaces? How can we use these technologies uh, in that way? So for some of my own research, um, methodologically, just to kind of ground, you might be wondering, why is this person in an English department? Um, uh, so part of what I do is I take a maker-based approach um, to a lot of my research, which means I actually try to actively create smartphone apps as part of my research practice. Because I believe by actually creating and working with technologies, we can kind of discover some of the affordances that they have as place-based writing technologies in public discourse. So this is an early project I did a few years ago. Um, and this picture on the left uh, is an image of a ghost bike. Uh, is anyone familiar with ghost bikes? A couple of people. So ghost bikes are uh, memorials or monuments to cyclists who have died uh, while traveling on a street, typically because they were hit by a car um, or something like that. And cycling communities will often place uh, a ghost bike at such locations, uh, not only to honor the person who was killed in the accident, but also kind of as a form of networked public protest. So it's a way of showing to the community, to um, you know, local governments, to politicians, whoever it may be, that this space is increasingly unsafe for cyclists and pedestrians. You can go to some cities in America, I was in New Orleans recently, there's one extremely dangerous intersection where there's about 15 or 20 ghost bikes that are still there. Um, however, in most cities across the country, when ghost bikes are locked up, they're typically removed fairly quickly. Um, so they're no longer able to kind of perform that rhetorical role, that persuasive role in showing a community, you know, here is how this space is damaging, you know, certain types of mobility or limiting certain types of mobility. Um, so I worked, I collaborated on a smartphone app that replaces a lot of the ghost bikes that had been removed in these spaces with digital augmented reality. Um, overlays that allow you to, you know, learn about the person who was killed at the location, um, uh, learn about kind of the history of, and culture of ghost bikes and how you can engage in similar advocacy um, efforts. So in this case, we're kind of thinking about one affordance, perhaps, of location-based or place-based media uh, is memorialization or to um, illuminate or amplify voices that have been marginalized or actively removed in the case of ghost bikes uh, from various locations. Um, so another project that I uh, just finished up recently uh, was thinking about how we can use um, smartphones and mobile media in a way to um, actively uh, uncover some of the historical um, and current contemporary issues with, within various public spaces. Um, so EcoTour uh, is an augmented, rea augmented reality walking tour of Paints Prairie, which is a public park uh, right outside of my former institution at the University of Florida. And the park was increasingly getting flooded more and more uh, as I was at school there, um, mostly because of the result of increased flooding and hurricanes, which a lot of uh, local scientists were attributing to climate change. Um, so a lot of the information about the park in terms of uh, climate change wasn't present within the actual signage in the space of the park itself. Um, and so this project, we teamed up uh, three different courses uh, at the University of Florida uh, to allow students to collaborate on a smartphone application for the space of the park itself. Uh, and I actually have a short video that I can show. Payne's Prairie State Park is a unique system of uplands and freshwater wetlands, home to more than 20 biological communities and over 400 species of wildlife. Visitors often walk the Lachua Trail in hopes of seeing alligators, bison, wild horses, or a vast array of plants and birds. The prairie encompasses over 21,000 acres of savanna and over 121,000 acres of watershed, directly connected to the Alachua County Sink and the Floridian Aquifer. Yet hundreds of years of development, redevelopment, and polluted stormwater runoff have degraded Florida's water systems, affecting the delicate ecology of Payne's Prairie. Thus, EcoTour, visualizing the environment of Payne's Prairie, works to educate visitors and spread awareness concerning ecological threats facing the park. EcoTour is a mobile, augmented reality walking tour that connects the ecological history of Payne's Prairie to current environmental issues. Using an interactive map and augmented reality technology, visitors can scan existing signs within the park to access multimedia augmented reality overlays, including archived audiovisual media related to specific physical locations. EcoTour helps users visualize the complex relationships between the prairie's natural environment, 
human development, and climate change. By encouraging the community to engage with the park in this way, we hope to provide not only awareness of the damage being done to our ecosystems, but to foster change by enacting a sustainable and emplaced critique. Okay, so this project um, was created uh, as, part of, as part of the park as a way of providing alternative tours. So you see some of the overlays were for different age groups or things like that, um, providing some kind of scavenger hunt style ways of navigating the space. Um, so essentially we're thinking about, this is a way of modeling how mobile media can be used to kind of transform interactions uh, with kind of existing cultural spaces or providing different histories uh, that may have been erased or silenced from the location. Uh, part, of the, part of the application talked about the indigenous history of the park, which wasn't present in the historical representation of the space uh, as well. Um, okay, so this is the, the final one. I don't need the sound of this one. So I used um, some, of the, some of the stuff that I was thinking about in this to create a course um, uh, while I was at UF. Uh, to allow students to imagine how they might use these technologies to rewrite uh, interactions with the campus space. And the students collaborated uh, to create a historic tour of the University of Florida campus, um, dug into different archival materials, things like that, to overlay historic video footage um, and different things around the campus space. Um, so this is a really fun project to do. Um, it was a very high kind of technical learning curve, um, but it was cool to see how the students were able to think about these technologies, you know, not just as a way of like disengaging from different locations, or, you know, a distraction or something like that, but how these technologies create new types of interactions with the material world and make you think about the material world um, in a different way. Um, and so I think that's one area to really think about as we're moving forward to this kind of emerging computing paradigm is what is the role of the humanities kind of in this emerging arena of communication and place-based interaction. Um, and I'm hoping uh, as I move forward in my research to create more of these types of experiences to illuminate what those affordances uh, might be. And if you're a student, uh, you should enroll next spring uh, in my Writing Digital Spaces course, uh, where we're gonna be doing um, some of this kind of stuff, um, looking at these different technologies, kind of talking about um, ethical and political issues surrounding augmented reality and mobile media, and also actively creating uh, some of these place-based experiences um, ourselves. And so, uh, even if you've never used any technology before, you're a writer, which I know some of you are definitely writers, I heard you're writing, it's incredible. Uh, come and join me because we need uh, humanists and people who are good at creating stories and thinking about stories in new and creative ways and what it means to tell a story on location or to tell a story as a route through a location or creating alternative routes through a location. So uh, thank you. That's, uh, yeah.